The person whom you're trying to reach is currently unavailable. The toll-free number you have dialed has been disconnected. They say silence is golden, but is it possible that too much silence is not such a good thing? There is a room in the U.S. that's so quiet, it becomes unbearable after a short time. The longest anyone has survived in the so-called anachoric chamber at Orfield Laboratories in South Minneapolis is just 45 minutes. It's 99.99% sound absorbent and holds the Guinness World Record for the world's quietest place. But if you stay in there too long, you may start hallucinating. It has 3.3-foot-thick fiberglass acoustic wedges, double walls of insulated steel, and one-foot-thick concrete. The company's founder and president, Stephen Orfield, said, We challenge people to sit in the chamber in the dark for 45 minutes. When it's quiet, ears will adapt. The quieter the room, the more things you hear. You'll hear your heart beating. Sometimes you can hear your lungs, hear your stomach gurgling loudly. In the anechoic chamber, you become the sound. And this is a very disorienting experience, Mr. Orfield explained. It's so disorienting that sitting down is a must. The chamber is used by a number of manufacturers which test how loud their products are. My friends, we live in a world where there is constant noise, constant action and activity. And it is a rarity that we experience very little noise or complete silence. Noise and even ambient noise is something we are accustomed to and even prefer. Some people say they can only sleep with ambient or white noise. Some students claim they study better with music. How many of you, when you are praying in silence, have experienced your mind begin to wander, unable to concentrate because it is simply too quiet? When there is silence, we become very uncomfortable, very uneasy, even disturbed and impatient. Silence is especially painful when it seems that God is silent to our pleas and requests through our prayers. And it is made worse when in those painfully long periods of silence from God, there are many others who testify of how God has, quote-unquote, spoken to them and answered their prayers. When the silence and a seemingly lack of answer from God becomes agonizing, often uncertainties fill our minds as to why God isn't answering and why He is so silent. So what are we to do when God is silent? We've been looking at this series of how we are to respond when God answers yes, no, or wait. But what about when we come to a situation where God is silent? There doesn't seem to be any clarity as to God's answer to our pleas and request, and the silence is deafening. Let's look at Scripture for some biblical principles for what we are to do when God is silent. When God is silent, it is important to remember, number one, His sovereignty. Remember God's sovereignty. Remember God's sovereignty. God's sovereignty speaks of His right to be in control as He reigns supreme in all aspects, over everything He has created. Therefore, this supremely sovereign God is under no obligations to give us an answer. When we ask of Him in prayer, our request, or even plead with Him, we're only humbly seeking for a response. We cannot demand an answer from Him. Now, this truth makes Him seem like a God who is indifferent. And you may ask me, Pastor, but what about all of those Bible verses that tell us that God answers? like Psalm 86, verse 7, where it says, In the day of my trouble, I will call upon you, for you will answer me. My point is that when God will answer, it is on His time frame, not ours. While we wait for Him to answer, know that He has the right to be silent. In fact, God doesn't even have to answer you, to inform you, or to let you know anything specific to what you have asked, apart from what He has already revealed about Himself in nature and through the special revelation of His Word, the Bible. By way of example, it's like when a child asks his or her parent a question as the parents are busy doing something. Does the parent have to answer the child at that moment? 
even if the child is screaming or yelling at the parent to answer and to decide, the parents don't have to answer. The parents could be thinking about how to answer or still deciding if it's a decision. Or perhaps, as some parents have thought, the more this child disrespects me or demands an answer to his request, the more I'm not going to answer to teach him or her a lesson. This is only a real-life example to show that parents have the right not to respond and to be silent. It is not to say that God is too busy to answer His children or that He is unable to handle billions of prayer requests at the same time or even that He needs time to think about things in His omniscience and sovereignty. I'm simply illustrating the right of the one who is in control and sovereign to remain quiet. The Old Testament story of Job is a reminder of a righteous man who walked closely with God, but cries out to God for answers to his questions and receives nothing but silence from God for what is seemingly a very long time. Job cries out to God for the first 37 chapters of this 42-chapter book, and God is silent. He doesn't speak in the first 37 chapters. All sorts of questions are posed by Job and his friends directly and indirectly to God about why certain events and tragedy have fallen upon the life of Job. God finally answers Job in chapters 38 to 42, near the very end of this book. And look at God's reply in Job chapter 38, verses 4 and 5. Job chapter 38, verses 4 and 5. And God said, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know, or who stretched the line upon it? This is God's way of reminding Job and us as readers of His Word that God continues to be in charge of this universe and is sovereign over all. Therefore, He has the right to be silent. If you think there are times you can demand of God an answer and He is silent, and so you get angry and upset, I encourage you to go and read chapters 38 to 42 of the book of Job and try to answer the questions that God poses to Job. You see, the questions posed by God to Job are questions that even you and I cannot answer because our minds are limited and God is all-powerful and all-knowing. And Job finally comes to this realization. And in Job chapter 42, verse 3, he says this, You asked, who is this who hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Here in this verse, Job quoted God. Who is this that obscures my counsel without knowledge? He did so to infer that God has the right to be silent because He is sovereign. Job had spoken without fully recognizing where he stood in the pecking order of things, which is way at the bottom compared to Almighty God. You see, God had talked about things beyond Job's comprehension in chapters 38 to 41, things too wonderful and awesome in creation for Job to fully grasp. Job was unable to answer any of the sovereign God's barrage of rhetorical questions, Job admitted to flunking God's biology examination. So Job backed down and threw out his complaints as to why God didn't answer his questions. And the surprising thing is that God never answered Job's questions of why or his requests. God simply revealed to Job how great and awesome he is. My friends, there are things in this life we cannot comprehend with our human mind. And if we cannot comprehend something, then we cannot expect Almighty God to have to answer our prayers and questions. He doesn't owe me an explanation or answer to something I will never fully understand. It's like a five-year-old asking his parents, who are nuclear scientists, what they do for a living. An experienced parent knows that that child will not understand and either change the subject, remain silent, or simply say, we help people. Imagine if that child's parents were to try to explain the intricacies of a nuclear reaction or the details of a radioactive isotope to that five-year-old child. That child would come back with even more questions of why and how, 
And that answer would not be beneficial to that child. In Living by God's Surprise, Harold Myra writes, My pastor Bob Harvey tells how early in his ministry a close friend died. In an effort to comfort the widow, also a close friend, Bob shared all his seminary textbook theological explanations of how and why God might have let this happen. But the woman rebuked him lovingly. Pastor, she said, I don't need a God like that. I don't need to understand all of this. What I need is a God who is bigger than my mind. There is great truth to this woman's response. Will having the answer to your questions make the loss or the pain better? Perhaps it will even make us more angry at the Lord because we can't fully comprehend and understand what the sovereign God is doing throughout the universe. So oftentimes in His sovereignty, a loving God who knows what is best for us chooses to be silent to our questions and our prayers. Secondly, when God is silent, we should remember number two, His mercy. Remember God's mercy. Remember God's mercy. God's mercy speaks of God's actions where He often doesn't give us what we deserve. When we deserve discipline, but God doesn't dole it out, it is His mercy at work. Now, you may ask, what in the world does God's silence have anything to do with His mercy? You see, often people naturally think that when God is silent, He must be mad at us, and that's why He is silent. Or perhaps we have done something terribly wrong, and that's why God is silent. But God's mercy reminds us that even if we have sinned and disappointed God through our words and actions, God doesn't deal with us in a tit-for-tat manner. His mercy along with His grace, treats us in ways we do not deserve. And therefore, God is not silent because He is pouting like when a wife doesn't talk to her husband and gives him the silent treatment because he has forgotten their anniversary or her birthday. God is silent because He is a great reason for being silent, and His mercy reminds us that God still very much loves us. Look at a psalm of David in Psalm 13. If you remember, David was one who walked closely with the Lord and known as one who had a whole heart for God and someone whom God loved. But there were times in the life of David when God was silent in his life. I read now from Psalm chapter 13, verses 1 to the first part of verse 3. How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? How long shall I take counsel in my soul? having sorrow in my heart daily. How long will my enemy be exalted over me? Consider and hear me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes. In these verses, you can feel David's agony and impatience with God's silence. David's mind begins to wonder if God really cares for him. And he wonders if God's silence means he's going to allow David's enemies to have victory over him as he recounts in verses 3 and 4. By the way, can I say that it's all right to pour your heart to God as David does in these verses, to tell God that you're hurting, that you are in deep anguish and agony for His seeming inaction and His silence. God understands and is compassionate when we express our hurts. Just read Psalm 102. But look at what David declares in verse 5 of Psalm 13 as his mind begins to wander. But I have trusted in your mercy. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. Verse 6, I will sing to the Lord because He has dealt bountifully with me. In spite of God's silence, David says, I will remember God's mercies. Or in the Hebrew, His hesed, often translated loving kindness. The emphasis of the Hebrew word hesed here in verse 5 is, is more than just simply mercy, the giving of what is not deserved. But it is the giving of what is not deserved because God is loyally loving to David. It is a loyal mercy. David remembers a God who, while silent, is full of loving kindness. And it is this type of loyal love that God extends His mercy. God's silence doesn't come from a God who is angry. But His silence comes from someone who is supremely merciful because He is so loving. 
If you ever get a chance, you should visit the ancient Roman city of Pompeii in Italy. It is a city that has literally been frozen in time because of a sudden volcanic eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD. The volcano buried the city under a thick carpet of superheated volcanic ash. The dust poured across the land like a flood, one witness wrote, and shrouded the city in a darkness like the black of a closed and unlighted room. More than 2,000 people died, and the city was abandoned. One of the most moving things you will see if you go to this now archaeological site is of a mummified mother and child, where the mother instinctively and instantly protects the child from the deadly volcanic ash by wrapping her body around the child, probably without saying a word because of how quickly it all happened. You can see the heart of a mother who doesn't have to say anything in words, but who through her action shows such great love. This is the picture in my mind as illustrated in Scripture of how God silently surrounds and protects us because of His mercy based on His chesed, His loyal love. His silence doesn't naturally mean He's angry at us. Even if God doesn't say a word in response to our prayers, His action on the cross to save each one of us from our sins, if we place our trust in Him, clearly shows His grace and mercy. Thirdly, when God is silent, we should remember, number three, to trust Him. Remember to trust the Lord. Remember to trust the Lord. Just because God is silent doesn't mean we stop trusting in Him, which many do. Often in gadgets and equipment, sound comes from the accompanying action so that the sound heard indicates that it is working. So, for example, with many consumer devices, we can find out about their status without having to look at them directly. When a kettle whistles, you know that the water has boiled. When a toaster pops, you know that the toast is ready. The gentle hum of a freezer tells you it's functioning normally. The more you use a particular device, the more you get used to its sounds. If you hear something different, like a car engine making an odd sound, it may be time to phone a mechanic. But the sound is often only an alert. The sound itself isn't doing the action. Like, for example, when we dial a number on our cell phones, do we really need to hear the numbers dialing or the sound of ringing for that phone to actually call the other person? No. We only need to hear the sound to assure us that it is working. So conversely, the point is no sound or silence does not imply that nothing is being done or it doesn't work. We can still trust even if there is silence. As it relates to God, just because He is silent doesn't mean He isn't working. And it doesn't mean He can't do what you've requested. His silence does not diminish in any way His character and His attributes, so we can remember to continue to trust Him. I like what Tony Evans says about what God is doing when He is silent. He writes, It's one thing to be in the middle of a trial that has been brought on by yourself through a bad choice or action, but it's entirely different to set your heart on serving God only to discover that it seems He has abandoned you in the middle of a storm. In times like those, remember that although God may be silent, He is not still. Wait on Him. He may just come walking to you on top of your storm. I like that phrase. Although God may be silent, He is not still. Look at Psalm 22, which is another psalm of David. Psalm 22, verse 1 and 2. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from helping me and from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not hear. And in the night season, and I am not silent. It seems from this psalm that God is very silent at a time when David thinks he needs to hear from God. David thinks that God doesn't hear his cries for help. And like Job, David is a man who walked with God and whom God loved very much. And so for sure, God would answer him. Yet God was silent in this season of his life. But look what David writes in verses 3 to 5 and verse 8. But you are holy, enthroned in the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in you. They trusted and you delivered them. 
They cried to you and were delivered. They trusted in you and were not ashamed. Verse 8, He trusted in the Lord. Let Him rescue him. Let Him deliver him since He delights in him. David notes that God is trustworthy even in His silence because His ancestors and forefathers trusted in God and God always delivered them. So it doesn't matter if God is seemingly silent at this time because the intrinsic character of God who never changes is one who can still be trusted even in His silence. Note the correlation of those two words. They trusted and were delivered. They trusted and were delivered. David understood this. And so David says, even in your silence, God, as my forefathers did, I will trust so that I will be delivered. My friends, the reason we want God to answer and not be silent is because we want to know that all will be well. We want to know it's going to be okay. We want to trust Him through His reply. That's why little children keep asking questions. They want to be sure that what has been promised is going to happen. If you promise on Monday to take them to get ice cream on the weekend, you can be sure they're going to ask you every day until Saturday if they're really going to go to get ice cream. Or parents of little children know that when they're going out for a date or for an event, they are peppered with questions. Where are you going? What time are you coming home? Is it far? Who are you going with? It can be a bit annoying as we wonder why our little children are acting like our parents. But in reality, they're asking because it comes from a place of insecurity. They want to be assured that their parents will come back and that they will come back safely to be with them. So when my children were young and asked those questions, Cindy and I would promise them that we would check in on them when we came home and that they would know we checked in on them when we got home, even though they were sleeping, because we would put a toy by their pillows so that when they woke up in the morning, they would see the toy and know we dropped by their rooms to check in on them. When we started this practice, it lessened their questions. Of course, nowadays with our teenagers, we tell them we're going out, and their only reply is, okay. Now, what changed from a child to a teenager? Well, for one, our teens are busy with their own things. But in reality, they don't need a lot of explanation because from experience and trust, they know that we will come back to them. In the same way, we can trust God in His silence because of who He is and what He has done in the past, which proves that He has heard our prayers and requests and is working things out for our best, as Romans 8.28 reminds us. Anyone who has lived or worked in a skyscraper knows tall buildings sway in the wind. There is no danger. The engineers know it will happen. But the sway is uncomfortable for people inside. That's why in buildings like Taipei 101, there is a tuned mass damper. Suspended from the 92nd to the 87th floor, there's a pendulum that sways in silence to offset movements in the building caused by strong gusts of wind. Likewise, when the winds of life gust all around us, there is a stabilizing force that keeps us steady amidst challenges in the heart of every believer who is God the Holy Spirit that silently calms our fears. Therefore, the silence of God is something we can be okay with when we remember to trust in a loving God who is always with us and watching over us. We don't need to hear the sounds of God speaking because we are sure He is working often working silently in the background. Fourthly, when God is silent, we should remember, number four, to examine our lives. Remember to examine your life. Remember to examine your life. The Bible clearly teaches that a holy God is often silent because the one praying and the one requesting things is living a sinful life. That's why the second half of James chapter 5, verse 16 says, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Because we do not know if God's silence or the trials we're going through is because of punishment for sin or because of God's sovereign plan, then it is important that we eliminate the discipline for sin option, which is in our control. So begin by examining your life and asking yourself the question, are there any unconfessed sins in my life? 
We need to make sure there is no sin or sinful living that is preventing God from answering our prayers. In Psalm 66, verse 18, the psalmist declares, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Another translation puts it like this, If I had not confessed the sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened. In fact, Isaiah chapter 59, verses 1 and 2 echoes the same truth. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, nor His ear heavy, that it cannot hear. But your iniquities, meaning sins, have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden His face from you, so that He will not hear. The power of silence to get us to examine our lives is quite effective. There are many couples who have fought, who have experienced the dreaded silent treatment. And during that time when husband and wife are not talking, how many a spouse begin to examine their own hearts and evaluate their relationship? I know for certain at first, you will think that you did nothing wrong and you justify your actions. You think to yourself, I'm not going to speak first. My spouse needs to say sorry and apologize to me first. But naturally, after hours and days of continual silence, you will begin to examine your life to see if maybe you did something wrong, which perhaps you need to apologize for. I'm reminded of a funny story. A man and his wife were having some problems at home and were giving each other the silent treatment. Suddenly, the man realized that the next day he would need his wife to wake him up at 5 a.m. in the morning for an early morning business flight. Not wanting to be the first to break the silence and lose, he wrote on a piece of paper, please wake me at 5 a.m. He left it where he knew she would find it. The next morning, the man woke up only to discover it was 9 a.m. and he had missed the flight. Furious, he was about to go and see why his wife hadn't wakened him when he noticed the piece of paper by the bed. The paper said, it's 5 a.m., wake up. As Tracy Moore shares, the term silent treatment chillingly comes from 19th century prison reform. Instead of physical punishment or grueling work, which was believed to do nothing to truly alter the character of the criminal, prisoners would no longer be allowed to speak to each other and rarely be spoken to. They'd be referred to by a number and never their name, forced to cover their faces and spend long amounts of time in isolation. It was intended to break their will in a way no hard labor ever could. And that is what God does when at times He is silent to our desperate cries and prayers to Him, not because He is cruel, but in order to break our will so that we will examine our lives to see any areas that need confession and forgiveness. So when it seems God is silent to our prayers, It should encourage us to look deep within our lives and examine our hearts to see if there is any bitterness harbored or there is any sinful actions or if there are any idols in our lives, which is anything I love more than the Lord. As we examine our lives, if the Lord brings anything to mind, then ask Him for forgiveness. The Bible tells us that Jesus forgives us of all of our sins through His shed blood. He forgives the worst of sinners. There is no shame in confession and repentance. No one is perfect. This act of faith when we confess our sins and really desire for a changed life is what pleases God and restores our fellowship with Him. So when God is seemingly silent, examine your lives to rule out sinful living as a reason for His silence. Finally, when God is silent, we should remember, number five, that God is waiting for us to be silent. Remember, God is waiting for us to be silent. Remember, God is waiting for us to be silent. Let's be reminded that God is not as silent as we think He is. He has revealed Himself through His Son and in His Word, the Bible. He is always in a constant state of communication with us. In fact, it is possible that you already have an answer from God through His Word. The Bible is full of specific answers about what is right and wrong, as well as information about God's character and His intention for us as His children and His followers. So don't forget to dig into God's Word, His written communication to us, 
to find out what He has to say about the problems you are facing. You may be thinking He is silent, but He has already answered it in His Word. As you read the Bible, ask God to speak to you through the Holy Spirit who lives inside of you. Often Bible verses can have new significance and applications in light of the current problems you are facing. You see, we often ask God what we already know or should know through the Scriptures. For example, God, should I marry this girl who's not a believer, who's not a Christian? He's often silent because His words already reveal His answer, and we just need to obey. What more can He say if we won't follow what's already written? Because if we aren't going to take His advice that He's already given, why then should He continue to give it? If we're asking for God to reveal His perfect will in our life through life decisions in our prayers, but we're not even willing to follow what He's already told us to do in the Bible to live sanctified lives, then no wonder God is often silent and won't speak in our lives because He's already told us and we won't obey what we don't like. I remember staying over at my brother's apartment a few years back. He had a bookshelf full of books, and it was tilting forward away from the wall. It was not anchored to the wall. I jokingly told him, you better secure that bookshelf or else there may be an earthquake and that shelf is coming down on you and will fall on top of you while you sleep. He just laughed it off. It will never happen. There are no earthquakes in Texas. I kid you not. The next day, there was a 4.3 earthquake in Texas in our area because of a hidden fault line they didn't know about. As the old saying goes, if I've told you once, I've told you a thousand times, meaning I don't need to keep saying it over and over again. The truth is the same. It's not going to change. I only need to tell you once. Don't blame me if I don't keep telling you a thousand times. God's Word is there for us to read and to refer to for the answers that He has revealed. So it is that God is not really often silent at all. It's possible that we have not tuned in to hearing God. We are surrounded by background noise and countless distractions. God is trying to communicate with us, but we can't hear Him because we have blocked Him out with all the noise we have surrounded ourselves with. Silence scares us. It bores us. It makes us nervous. So we always have to have music in the background. We need to be talking with other people. We have to be listening to noise. And so our minds are always tuned in to the television or to Netflix. Or we always need to be online, connected to the internet. Instead of reading quietly our Bibles daily without any notifications popping up. Or spending a few quiet moments in prayer with God daily. Because it is in those moments when we can often hear that still, small voice of our Creator God prompting us what to do. It is in those moments that we can receive answers to our prayers, our worries, our concerns. Do you remember the story of Elijah in 1 Kings chapter 19, where he was discouraged, wondering why God was so silent and didn't help him? He felt so alone to the point of wanting his life to end. But look what happens, how God reveals Himself in 1 Kings chapter 19. I read verses 11 and 12. Then He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. A still, small voice. That's how God spoke to Elijah. That's why it's crucial to have a daily quiet time with God, so that through reading His Word, through prayer, through focusing on Him, God can speak to your hearts through the Holy Spirit in that still, small voice. You cannot hear the still, small voice of God if you have so many noise that surrounds you. Don't allow yourselves to be too busy that you don't take the time to listen. Remember to be quiet or else you won't hear. It's impossible to talk and listen at the same time. John Medina in his book, Brain Rules, writes this, Multitasking, when it comes to paying attention, is a myth. 
The brain naturally focuses on concepts sequentially, one at a time. At first, that might sound confusing. At one level, the brain does multitask. You can walk and talk at the same time. Your brain controls your heartbeat while you read a book. Pianists can play a piece with left hand and right hand simultaneously. Surely, this is multitasking. But I'm talking about the brain's ability to pay attention. This attentional ability is not capable of multitasking. John writes, recently I agreed to help the high school son of a friend of mine with some homework, which I don't think I will ever forget the experience. The son, whose name is Eric, had been working for about half an hour on his laptop when I was ushered into his room. An iPad was dangling from his neck, the earbuds cranking out Tom Petty, Bob Dylan, and Green Day as his left hand reflexively tapped the beat back. The laptop had at least 12 windows open, including two screens carrying simultaneous conversations with friends. Another window was busy downloading an image from Google. The window behind it had the results of some graphic he was altering for a friend. And the one right behind it was of a screen of a game playing midway. Buried in the middle of this activity was a word processing program holding the contents of the paper for which I had come to help provide assistance. Eric declared, the music helps me concentrate while taking a call on his cell phone. I normally do everything at school, but I'm stuck. Thanks for coming. Stuck indeed, John writes. Eric would make progress on a sentence or two on his paper, then reply back to a message that his friend was messaging him. Then he would see if his picture had finished downloading on Google, and then he would return to his paper. Clearly, Eric wasn't concentrating on his paper. Sounds like someone you know? To put it bluntly, research shows that we can't multitask. We are biologically incapable of processing attention-rich inputs simultaneously. If you have a lot of noise going around and surrounding your life, you will not be able to listen to God. So while we can functionally talk and listen at the same time, if we really want to pay attention to God, then we have to quiet ourselves in order to listen. That is why God is silent at times, to get us to start listening. He isn't going to talk if we are talking. Just because God seems silent doesn't mean you should doubt Him or stop praying. God's silence isn't a license for us to turn our backs on Him. Instead, it is an invitation to press forward, to seek Him more diligently, to press forward, to listen to Him, to lean in and hear Him, to sit in His love. And when He talks, you and I are ready to listen. As we close, you may still wonder why God is silent at times. John Bloom gives this good insight. He writes, I don't claim to understand all the mysteries of this experience of God's silence. But I believe there are clues for another purpose as well. I'll rephrase them as questions. Why is it that absence makes the heart grow fonder, but familiarity breeds contempt? Why is water so much more refreshing when we're really thirsty? Why am I almost never satisfied with what I have, but always longing for more? Why can the thought of being denied a desire for marriage or children or freedom or some other dream create in us a desperation we previously didn't have? Why is the pursuit of earthly achievement often more enjoyable than the achievement itself? Why do deprivation, adversity, scarcity, and suffering often produce the best character qualities in us while prosperity, ease, and abundance often produce the worst? Do you see it? There is a pattern in the design of deprivation. Deprivation draws out desire. Absence heightens desire. And the more heightened the desire, the greater its satisfaction will be. It is the mourning that will know the joy of comfort. It is the hungry and thirsty that will be satisfied. Longing makes us ask. Emptiness makes us seek. Silence makes us knock. So when God is silent, Remember His sovereignty. Remember His mercy. Remember to trust the Lord. Remember to examine your life. Remember God is waiting for us to be silent. 
Let me end with a simple prayer composed by a soldier at war during a time when his side was losing and when hope seemingly was lost and the silence of God was deafening. I ask God for strength that I might achieve. I was made weak that I might learn humbly to obey. I ask for health that I might do great things. I was given infirmity that I might do better things. I ask for riches that I might be happy. I was given poverty that I might be wise. I ask for power that I might have the praise of men. I was given weakness that I might feel the need of God. I ask for all things that I might enjoy life. I was given life that I might enjoy all things. I got nothing that I asked for, but received everything that I had hoped for. Almost despite myself, my unspoken prayers were answered. I am among all men richly blessed. That soldier experienced the voice of God and listened to every word. A struggle, yes. But this prayer was written on the other side of his struggle. We understood God never met him with silence. He only had to listen. My friends, however God answers you, whether he answers with a no or a wait or a yes or even in silence, may we continue to look to him and trust him, knowing that how he answers comes from his love comes from His grace, comes from His mercy, comes from His sovereignty, comes from His desire for us to have the best. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for reminding us through Your Word that when You are silent, that You are calling us to attention, that You are calling us to action. And if that action is to examine our lives to see if there's any sin in it, I pray that we would do so, that You would forgive us of our sins through your shed blood. Father, if it's to remove all of the distractions and clear away the noise that clutter our life, I pray that we would remove those things so that we can hear your voice clearly. I pray that if it is to recognize your sovereignty and grace and mercy, may we continue to look with greater focus to trust in the God who does not change and to be able to cling on to your attributes and your character. Heavenly Father, I pray that we would accept, lovingly and happily accept, however you answer our prayers, whether it's with a yes or no or wait, or even if it is in silence. I pray that we will humbly accept what you have in store for us, which is your best and comes from your loving heart. Bless your people, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.